am the good shepherd. So we talked about I am the bread. Uh, these are the eight I am statements of Jesus. We're looking for uh, a definition of God and a, a little bit of a better definition than, that than took us 1,600 years to get in the Westminster Catechism that never included the word love, uh, never included the word grace. Uh, there was a lot of things that were not included in the acceptable Christian definition of God. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't think we needed to wait 1,600 years just to read the scriptures when Jesus came down and said exactly who he was. And so this becomes our definition of who God is. I am the bread. I am the giver and the sustainer of life. But once again, in order for bread to be useful, it needs to be broken. I am the light. We want to remember, we want to, and we're flipping everything just about. Everything's getting flipped. We always believe that Jesus saying, I am the light, means that he came to expose our darkness, to expose our sin, to expose our depravity, to show us just how worthless we really are as human beings. But instead, he actually came to show us who God really was. It wasn't about our actions. It wasn't about our behavior. It wasn't about rules and following and doing. He came to show us who God was. And now we're able to see the image of God through Jesus Christ. And so therefore, he is the light that shines upon God so we can see Him in our own sin and in our own darkness. I am the door. Jesus is the door. Traditionally taught is Jesus is the door that gives us access to God. And now Jesus comes into the world. He goes to the cross. And we come to the cross. And now, now we have a door that gets us to God in heaven one day. And I said, well, maybe because of what the passage says, that I am the door that allows God to come into the fold of His sheep. Jesus is the door that God uses to get back to humanity. Remember, once again, God didn't separate Himself from us. We believed that we were separated from God in our mind. The path backward did not need us to find a path to reclaim ourselves or to reconcile ourselves to God. God needed to come to us to show us that we had it wrong all along and that there was no separation. Uh, a good guy that I know really well, his name is Brad Jerzak, and uh, he posted this thing the other day, and I, I think he might be plagiarizing me because he talked about the separation from God, but he said Adam and Eve sinned, and yet God pursued them. Cain killed Abel, and God pursued him. The Jews sinned against God, and yet God continued to pursue them. We continue to sin, and yet God continues to, to pursue us. Where is the separation? It didn't exist. Jesus is the door that grants God access back into our life so He can show us who He really is. And today, I am the Good Shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11 through 14. Uh, now, looking at this this week, I, I uh, was looking at that word shepherd. That word shepherd uh, is used about 16 times in the Greek. Um, 14 or 12 times, it's, yeah, it's used 14 times. 12 times it's translated as shepherd. I think one time it's translated as shepherds. And one time it's translated as pastors. The word pastor or pastors only appears one time in the entire Bible, and it's in Ephesians 4. Some are called as apostles, some as prophets, some as pastors, some as, or some as evangelists, some as pastors, some are teachers. That word pastor there is actually shepherd. Some are called to be shepherds. Jesus is the good shepherd. What does that mean? Why do we need a shepherd? And why does he say he's the good shepherd and not the shepherd? Am I a shepherd, but he's the good shepherd? So does that make me the bad shepherd? Once again, maybe we're not thinking dualistically just because there's a good doesn't mean there has to be a bad. And so what does Jesus mean by saying, I am the good shepherd? So today we're going to pick up in John chapter 10. Uh, we'll start at verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I laid down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. 
For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So the Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We know that. Jesus laid his life down for us. Why? Well, because the wolves are coming, and the wolves are wanting to attack. The wolves are wanting to devour and scatter the sheep all over the world. The the wolves don't want the sheep to be organized. The, The wolves don't want the sheep to be taken care of. And so, therefore, Jesus is willing to lay down his life to protect his sheep. He can't hire this out, because if he just hires somebody, and I'm just getting paid a salary, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't have a, 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 a what's that thing called profit sharing, you know, the, the, the company isn't profit sharing with me, they're just paying me a salary to take care of their sheep, I'm not invested in these sheep, I'm not going to lose my life for these sheep, I'll let these sheep die, I'll get fired, and I'll go get a new job, I'm not going to die for these sheep, so Jesus can't hire this out, he's got to be the shepherd, and he's got to be willing to lay down his life to protect us. Now, traditionally, Jesus lays down his life to protect us from God's wrath. And Jesus bore God's wrath upon the cross so we wouldn't have to. God is so angry and so disgusted with us that he's going to murder us and torture us and burn us with fire for all of eternity. Even though all those times in Jeremiah he said he would never do anything like that. We don't, we don't pay attention to those passages. And in that case is true, then Jesus is here calling God a wolf. And Jesus is protecting us from the wolf. When the wolves come, are the wolves God? Is that who God is? So maybe Jesus isn't protecting us from God. Maybe Jesus is protecting us from the people who, who don't want us to follow the shepherd. Maybe Jesus is protecting us from the people who don't want us to know who God really is. Maybe Jesus is protecting us from the very person or the very thing that tricked us into changing our mind about God in the very first place. And now we have a whole population of people who have been convinced and, and, and um, tricked into seeing and believing in a God that does not exist. Remember how many Christians believe in the angry, punishing, wrathful God of penal substitutionary atonement? And I'm thankful that that God doesn't exist. So do we actually believe in God, or do we believe in our thoughts about God? And the majority of the time, the God of our thoughts isn't real. Who's the God that shows up in our life? And how does God show up in our life? God showed up in my life many times. He never once had a rod. He showed up as bread. He showed up as light. He showed up as a door. He showed up as a shepherd. He showed up in my life, but it was never the God of my thoughts. It was never the God I I was taught so much about in seminary and other places. So Jesus is the good shepherd. He's willing to lay down his life. Who is he willing to lay down his life to? Because once again, we have passage after passage after passage in Luke and Acts and other places where it says that Jesus turned himself over to be murdered by Gentiles. That Jesus put himself in the hands of humans. And so this idea, this concept that God put Jesus on the cross, we put Jesus on the cross. Because we were the wolves that were going after the sheep. Because we didn't understand. Now, please understand, once again, who is Jesus talking to in this scene? He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the clergy. He's talking to the church-going Christians on Sundays. I mean, I know they didn't exist then, but in our context. So in our context, he's talking to me, and he's talking to you. And what does he say? I'm here to lay down my life to protect my sheep from you. You who think you got all the answers. You who think you know who God is. You who I'm telling need to repent. You 
who think you know God. You have the oracles of God. You've constructed the temple of God. And yet you are the ones that need to repent. You are the ones who need to change your mind about God. And lucky for you, I'm here to shepherd you through that process. Because I am the good shepherd. And I will lay down my life to you and for you. Because once again, who killed Jesus? It wasn't God. It was us. We were the ones crying out, Give us Barabbas! Murder Jesus! Give us Barabbas! Well, I find no fault in this Jesus. We don't care. Kill him anyway. Kill Barabbas, or give us back Barabbas, because Barabbas will just go up and blow up another building, but he'll commit another mass shooting, and we'll just be able to arrest him again. It's for no problem. We know how to stop Barabbas. We don't know how to stop Jesus. So we have him in custody. Let's just kill him because once we release him, we're not getting him back. Right? So what does Jesus say? I laid down my life of my own initiative. Nobody can kill me but me. And we know that to be true because Jesus, I mean, right now, literally, we're, we're like how many years after, you know, Good Friday, Black Friday, Good Friday, whatever you want to call it. When when is that? That's next Friday. No, two Fridays. Right? When is Easter? Two weeks? Three weeks? 21st. So we're like three, four weeks away from Easter. So, you know, 2,000 years minus a couple weeks. If Jesus wanted, he could still be hanging on that cross perfectly alive. The cross wasn't going to kill him. He gave up his spirit, remember? He kind of said, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. He allowed himself to die. And he allowed himself to be dead for three days. And then on the third day, he says, you know what? I'm not going to be dead anymore. I'm going to pick my life back up. Because I have the authority to do so. Because I allowed you to kill me for you to show you who I am. To show you just what I will go through. Just what I will allow you to put me through. I know some parents whose kids have put them through some awful, awful stuff, right? Think about being a parent of a kid who suffers from addiction. They steal from you. They lie to you. They manipulate you. Every time the phone rings, you panic because you think that they're dead or in prison. It's torturous. But yet you don't give up on them. Jesus was willing to show us all that he would allow us to do to him. All that he would allow us to put him through. The whippings, the beatings, the crucifixion, all that. But even on top of that, the rejection. I'm sorry, I've been hit. I've been punched in the face. I've been kicked. I've been hit with beer bottles. Nothing hurts more than being rejected. And Jesus was rejected by his own people. You don't think that hurt? You don't think that was painful? But he took it. And he comes back three days later and he says, I still didn't change my mind about you. I'm still your shepherd. I'm still your bread. I am still your God. This is who I've always been. You just didn't understand me. But luckily I came and my light is exposed to who I really am. Now you can really see me. Because as the author of Hebrews says, Jesus is the exact representation of God's Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Paul says that Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God. So if this is who Jesus is, this is who God is. Because Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature. Jesus says in here, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me even as I know the Father and the Father knows me. Think about that for a moment. Think about how well God knows the Father and how well the Father knows God. 
Jesus says, I know my own. I know you. It's the same way that I know my Father. And you know me. You may be confused. You might be living in the darkness. But you know me. You know when you hear my voice. And we've got to think about this. Do we really know when we hear God's voice? The little voice that says, don't go do that thing. Don't get in the car with that person who's been drinking. Or you know, We hear these voices. We don't always listen to them. And we don't always know who it is. But we hear it. Jesus, you know me. And how can we, how do I know him? Because from the very moment of creation, he placed himself inside of me. Right? Before the foundation of the world, now that I know where it's at, we can keep going back to it every week because I lost it for a while. It's Ephesians. Where does Ephesians go? I said I talk about these heavenly places. These heavenly places that just baffles me how we got this so messed up. Our job is to go to heaven, but yet we already have all the blessings of heaven now. Why would I need to go to heaven? Anyway, Ephesians verse 1, chapter 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Christ, in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. And He found us, and chose us to be in Christ before the foundation of the world, and that we would be holy and blameless. He predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. So before the foundation of the world, he chose us to be in him. And once again, doesn't say it here, but if we're in him, he's in us. Just like he's in the Father and the Father is in him. John 17, Father, I pray for their unity that they will be one just as you and I are one. I in them, them in me, I in you, you in me. Right? So we know Him. Because from the very moment of creation, He put Himself inside of us. And He put us inside of Him. He knows us. We know Him. But there's so much of the loud clatter going on in the world that it's hard for us to hear His voice. We've been so conditioned to listen to the other voices, so conditioned to listen to the dang chickens, that we don't listen to His voice. We listen to the people say, you're not good enough. You don't belong. You don't deserve. You can't do that. You're not going to accomplish it. You're not pretty enough. You're too fat. You're too slow. You're too short. You're too tall. You're never going to belong. You're never going to be good enough. But from the moment of, before the foundation of the world, he said you belong. He said you are mine. He said you are good enough. He said you are everything I needed you to be. And that's why I created you that way. And we got lost in the nonsense of the world. And good thing we have a shepherd to come and bring us back. Bring us back into the fold to help us see who God really is. Anybody familiar with the term chasing the dragon? I think chasing the dragon, anybody heard that before? Chasing the dragon. I know I know chasing the dragon. Chasing the dragon is, is usually a term used for um, heroin addicts. Because the first time you use heroin, it releases a. Uh, uh, I don't know the chem. I'm gonna, I, don't, I won't guess that, but it releases a chemical in the brain that, that in, elicits a euphoria. That's just the most amazing euphoria you'll ever experience in your life. But once it's released, it doesn't get released again. That's why the power of heroin is so strong, because you spend the rest of your addiction chasing the dragon, chasing that first experience, but you can never have the experience again. You're chasing something that doesn't exist. I mean, you hear people talk about it. they're chasing after the love of their father who abandoned them and rejected them and doesn't want anything to do with them and they're never going to get what they want. They're chasing the dragon. They're chasing something that doesn't exist. And for centuries, ever since the garden, humanity has been chasing the dragon. We've been trying to appease a father who never needed to be appeased. We're trying to reconcile with a father who never separated himself from us. We're trying to, to, to uh, uh, appease the anger or the wrath of a father who never had any anger or wrath towards us. 
We're chasing the dragon. And the good shepherd comes in and he shines light on who God really this is. See, this is who you're chasing over here. And see, it's empty and void because that God that you're chasing doesn't exist. This is who God is. Allow me to shepherd you back into the fold because once again, as we looked about last week, God comes in to the pen where the sheep are. And then He leads them back out. He comes in the door to lead us out of the door. And Jesus is the shepherd, shepherding us out into our freedom. We no longer need to be constrained by the box. The box of church. The box of the Bible. The box of Christianity. The box of religion. We can be freed from those boxes and come out of that into the freedom of love that only exists in God, that cannot be institutionalized, cannot be defined, cannot be put onto a plaque or a meme on Facebook. It just is. And this is what Jesus is trying to shepherd us into, is this life. People say, we got, i got to find a way to learn how to love people. There is no way to learn how to love. Love is the way. Your life is love. Everything you have is love. Love isn't a thing. It just is. We talk about God's presence in the water and the fish. Fish asking for the water is like us asking for God's love. A fish asking for God's... Uh, the fish asking for water is like us asking for God's presence. We're never not in it. We're never not surrounded by His love. We're never not surrounded by His presence. This is the difference between us and fish. Fish don't realize they're in water until you take them out of water. And then I'm sure they start, Wait, what happened? They don't realize that the water is why they're able to breathe. They don't realize the water is why they have food. They don't realize that the water is their shelter. They're just happy to have it, but they don't they have no recognition of the water. We're not fish. We're human beings. We have the ability to be aware of the water. We have the ability to realize that the water provides us the breath in our lungs, the love in our hearts, the food in our belly. We have an awareness of the ability to be aware of God and God's presence all around us. And this is what Jesus is trying to shepherd us into. This is what Jesus is trying to help us help get us to see. He's trying to help us shepherd us into the freedom of the water. It doesn't work by command, kid. You actually got to push it. <laughs> Some things you have to teach children and you just don't realize you're going to have to teach them. Jesus says here, I have other sheep. I have other sheep who are not of this fold. But they need to hear my voice. They need to recognize who I am. That's us, right? He's talking to Jews. Jews think that they're the chosen ones. Christians, we think that we are the chosen ones. We're the, we're the ones who got it right, finally. You know, the, the one cartoon I, I love, it's, hold on, it's a classroom. And there's this, like, sideways tree, you know. There's all these boxes, and it keeps getting bigger, keeps getting bigger, and keeps getting bigger. And then teacher's like, and then right here we were... We finally came along here and we got it right. Right? And then a little kid in the classroom says, God's so lucky to have us. Right? Because we as the Christians, we think, you know, if you're Baptist or you're Presbyterian or whatever you are, you think that you're the ones that finally came along and got it right. That everybody else before you had it wrong. But Jesus says, there's other sheep. You're not my only sheep. This is just one fold. But all the sheep have the same shepherd. And I came not just for you. 
I didn't come to die just for you who believe me. I came to lay down my life for all my sheep. And please point your finger at somebody who's not God's sheep. Please point your finger at somebody who God did not create. Point your finger at somebody who God did not foreknow. Who did he not lay down his life for? I have other sheep, people. You're not the only ones who got it right. There's more. And your objective as people who see me as the shepherd is to go out and help me be a shepherd. Help, hear, help other people learn how to hear my voice. But once again, this is where I make the distinction between typical spiritual sperm donors and spiritual midwives. Sources for answers, sources for questions. We don't have to be somebody's answers. I can't convince you of anything based upon my experience. And I don't want to convince you based on my own. I want to take what I have and impregnate you with my experiences and my understanding. I want to help usher you along the journey so you can begin to see God through your experiences and your understanding. And that's what the world needs us to be. Shepherds. Not injectors. Not people who just come along and say, I'm right, you're wrong. Bah! People are going to come along and say, oh, tell me about your life. Tell me about what's going on. Oh, you don't see God there? Oh, that's a, that's, I can see God there. You don't, you don't see that? You don't see how God got you through that? Let me tell you about the God that I believe in. Because where you think He abandoned you, I'm saying He loved you. 